think there you go. All right. For some reason, we had to add you. So who are we missing? Uh, we're missing one person here. Um, she'll 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 sign on in a minute. Um, I'm glad everyone's here. Is there any because uh, you know we still have a few minutes, ten ten minutes for the the session. Are you guys all right? Any questions? Any issues you might have? Um, anyone need to test a microphone or do something? Because I think when I, you, when I when I listen to the yeah. other participants, I've listened to a few few uh, panels, and you can definitely become quite disturbed if you're not muting the mic when others yes. are speaking. So I think yes. that's something to do. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to make a comment about just to remind you about that. Um, I, I'm a, personally a little concerned uh, that we're going to get a bunch of comments, you know, in the on the side margin. Um, I'm going to try to go through those as we go, and we may turn a couple of those into, you know, comments or questions for the panel. We'll see. Sometimes the comments are uh, help advance the discussion, and sometimes they're just almost trivial. Oh, there's Anne. Um, can you? Good to sorry, see you. can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Yep. No problem. Oh, yes. No Thank problem. You. <laughs> so um, we, you know, we'll we'll see how that goes with the comments on the side. But I did send you guys a list of five questions that we may get through. One, we may get through two. We'll we'll see. I like having more questions than, um, you know, than we have time to deal with. Um, did you pick up anything else from the sessions? Uh, Anna, look, you, you said you were, you were listening in, uh, or Eva Lota, did you, any advice, any takeaways from those, the, the session you attended? Well, well, I actually think most of the comments, because you can see the chat forum on the right side, right? I think a lot of right. comments are very, very valid, actually. And mm -hmm. it's more engaging if you can, you know, incorporate them in, in the panel because it becomes more right. than just talking. And then, right. Another I have is if, if someone just keeps talking, please interrupt the person. Yeah. If it's me, please interrupt me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of keep a stopwatch uh, on everybody. So, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly give you a one minute warning and then we'll have to unfortunately move on after five minutes. And if you want to end sooner, that's that's great. So I suspect some of you may just want to take two or three minutes and that's very, very appropriate. And as I mentioned, we'll, I'll try to track the comments. We'll, we'll all be looking at the comments um, and we'll see what we can do with those comments. But I have in kind of my back pocket some of these questions and we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. All right. You know, one, other, one other thing I noticed in uh, watching some of the panels is that the moderator uh, versus just saying start with your opening comments sort of opened up to each panelist with a question before their comments, sort of making them focus on a theme. Yeah. And keep it, um, keeping it rolling from what they heard from the previous. Um, okay. Um, In case that, you think, I think that's not off base from. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I've talked to everybody in advance in, I think you're set up with your comments. So if we add an additional subject and then you add your comments, it's, it's going to be more difficult to manage the time, I think. Um, but, you know, please take notes. If you want to come back, um, you know, for example, if Joe says something that somehow strikes you and you want to come back to that later, Let's absolutely uh, do that. Just I'm just using that as an example. Okay. Um, anything else folks have? Concerns? There, sorry, I just want to know the questions. Are they, how do you want to apportion the questions? Are you going to do that? Do they... You know, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure because I'm not sure about the comments that we're going to be getting and if we should respond to one, two, none of them, I, I don't know. Um, we're, and so also, I don't know fully what you're going to say. And um, if, for example, you've already covered an answer to one of the questions, I'm, I, I'm not going to ask that question to be redundant. So okay. it just gives me a lot of flexibility to ask a question if it wasn't covered in, in any of the 
introductory comments. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll we'll see how that goes. We'll see how it goes. I'd like to have as much time for the panel to respond and engage after we've done the you know your your opening comments. Um, but I, I, you know, it's going to be difficult to. It's I, kind of I'm worried about being Chris Wallace in the presidential debates where everybody's kind of talking over each other. So um, not that we have anyone who's going to play the role of Donald Trump what? here, but it, it, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my but, you know, it, when we have six people and little delays and muting and stuff, it could get problematic. So we have I'll, people joining already. So I'm wondering, are people letting, I can see where it. We have eight. Yeah, we have eight. We have a couple of people. So they are. They'll uh, unless they're super interested in listening to what we have to say. My guess is they'll probably. <laughs> they're probably working on email. There you go. Seven. <laughs> they're probably working on email. So. Alan, the great thing about this is that you have a mute button. So if uh, if we get like the debate, you can just actually shut us up. Um, Unfortunately, Chris Wallace didn't have. Yeah. Well, it's not so uh, – I think you guys need to control the mutes, and, and mostly people do that, but then they, they forget. So, um, Yes, that happens. Okay. I think we have to all be on mute because it does sound like there's a bit of feedback, yeah. Alan, when you're speaking. Yeah. So we do have to all be on – let's try all be on mute. Why, why don't, Alan, you keep talking just so we can hear – everyone go on oh, mute other than – That could be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think is that uh, give me your thumbs up if it sounds clear. It's okay. Okay, great. All right, I think we're going to go unless anyone wants to engage in uh, any conversation. I think we'll just go silent for five minutes and then we'll go ahead and get it started. All right. Okay.
I think we'll give it another minute. But right now, we do not have anyone signed into our session, as far as I can tell. So we'll be talking to each other. Well, that's not too bad, is it? Could be that, kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, that's super weird. However, I would say that they people typically go from one thing to the next. So if sure. the last session isn't over yet, I'm guessing they maybe aren't. Well, the last session, which we overlap with, are Frank's closing remarks. So that's probably still going on. Yeah, huh. when does when does that end? It, because it should not, it, I don't think it overlaps, but you know, it, those things tend to go on a little bit and certainly possible. I do feel uh, some sympathy for the folks over in Europe or Asia um, because this is a really tough time for a lot of people around the world. U Europe, it's getting late. Uh, yeah. e e and and um, if you happen to be east of Europe, you know, it's really bad. So, okay. Well, I think we're, we'll go ahead and get started because we have a relatively short window and I'm, I'm confident as we move forward, we'll have more people sign into the session. Um, welcome to our session under the title of CEO in the Age of Disruption. Uh, my name is Alan Morrison. I'm a professor of global management and former CEO and director general of the Thunderbird School of Global Management based in Phoenix, Arizona. Defining our times as volatile would be the understatement of the decade, whether it's pandemics, political or economic turmoil. The landscape is changing around us uh, at a pace rarely ever seen. Massive disruptions are testing our capabilities as leaders and as organizations and are forcing us to reconsider and adapt our leadership and management styles. Uh, projecting a strong sense of purpose and stability in the age of disruption is arguably the toughest challenge business leaders face today. In this session, we'll be joined by five esteemed business leaders uh, and panel members who will help us discuss how CEOs and other senior executives can take advantage of disruptions to define new futures and to remake their businesses. Joining me on the panel are Alusala Atnuga, and Winblad, Joe Herkin, Joanna Riley, and Eva Lota Jostet. I'll introduce each panel member separately, then give them a few minutes to offer their insights. And following this, we'll open it up for some additional questions and dialogue. Uh, please feel free, those who are participating um, virtually and online as, uh, as members to post any comments or questions as we move through the the uh, discussions. Our session will end at uh, half past the hour. We'll go ahead and start with Alusala Adnuga. She is the managing director and the CEO of Ola Systems Limited. Ola Systems is one of the top Oracle partners providing IT services to leading financial services and tech companies in Nigeria. Prior to founding Ola Systems, Alusala had a wide and varied work background, work experience that uh, spanned more than 30 years in banking and high tech and high tech industries. Um, Alusala, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Um, I like by starting to thank Frank um, um, to give him the privilege to be part of this uh, panel. Um, the founder and um, chairperson of uh, Horasis. And uh, thank you, Alan, for being the moderator of this um, panel. Uh, indeed, it's a time of disruption, and um, we're discussing today the CEO in the age of disruption. Um, I'll be focusing on the ability to show visionary leadership. And um, of course, this era, there's no better era to talk about this than this time of uh, pandemic. Um, 
as a visionary leader, uh, what are the attributes that are necessary to be a visionary leader? You have to think innovatively, um, see what others cannot see, see the big picture, see opportunities within the chaos and set goals beyond your lifetime. Um, if you need to um, effectively communicate with your uh, team members, that is the vision of the organization, you need to motivate your team also, uh, have positive mindset, uh, be, build confidence and clarity around the vision of um, the company. You should be able to adapt to change, that is uh, be open to new ideas, Learn new skills if it's necessary so that you can remain uh, relevant. Uh, the strategy, of course, you adopt at this time would greatly determine uh, success. Um, there should be deep sense of uh, commitment by the visionary leader. Uh, despite uh, challenges, commitment would keep you going and focused. Um, I would also like to talk briefly. Uh, in all this, the visionary leader, uh, the task, of course, begins with uh, with you as a visionary leader. You should be able to know your strengths and uh, leverage on them and manage your energy. I think the energy part of it is quite important. Uh, when I talk about energy, I'm talking about emotion, mind and body. At this time, when it comes to emotion, it's not a time to panic at all. You need to encourage yourself. And when I talk about mind, you must have a positive mindset. Uh, be sure that you have positive people around you and uh, you need to feed your soul positively. That is the kind of news you listen to at this time is also very key. And of course, whatever your mind conceives, your body believes, you know, at this time. Well, because of time, I would just go straight to my final thoughts on this. Um, in all this, there are more emerging business opportunities, um, obviously, and um, future uh, business sources will be achieved by visionary leaders. And of course, at the other side of pain, there are opportunities. And I also believe with uh, resilience, hope, optimism, and uh, faith in God, uh, far outweigh the negative forces against us. So once again, I say thank you for the privilege to be on this panel. Thank you. Your mic is mute. Yeah, okay. There we go. That's it. Uh, I would just uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, and um, I want to encourage everyone to keep their mics mute and, muted, and mine was muted. <laughs> I have to remind you to unmute it, too. Uh, thank you for your comments. I'm sure we'll get back to you uh, during the additional follow up discussion that we have. We want to hear from Ann uh, Winblad uh, next. Ann, uh, thank you for joining us. She's a managing director and founding partner of Hummer Winblad Venture Partners. Uh, the first venture firm focused exclusively on software. She has a 30 year career as a venture capitalist. Her firm has launched over 160 enterprise software companies. It's an amazing track record. And she served on the boards of investment that pioneered successful companies across the enterprise software uh, sector. She's currently a director of Ace Metrics and Optimine and as a member of the Board of Trustees of the University of St. Thomas and the Richard M. Schultz Family Foundation. Anne, over to you. Uh, I also want to extend my thanks to you, Alan, and to Frank for putting this conference together in these challenging times. I, I don't know how many of you might have read Zoom's prospectus recently, but you may have noted that they pointed out that one of their customers had a thousand employees and no corporate office. It's probably seems surprising to people that companies like this existed pre-COVID, but these are the types of companies we've been funding for the last decade. Uh, the reason for the distributed company or the virtual company as we call it today was not to prepare for events like we're dealing with now, but really it was a talent shortage. All, on a macro level, it was an adaptive strategy, which everybody needs today. We've seen massive growth in my sector software, and as you all know, the most valuable companies on the planet today are these software companies. So we learned a lot about mastering leadership in a virtual company, um, how, not just how you use tools like Zoom or Teams or Slack to engage with your employees and partners, 
or how you build companies that are self-service, uh, both in how they deliver their products, how they service the customers, and how they engage with, uh, with their employees. It's probably important to point out that it was 15 years ago this year that Amazon released their cloud platform. So self-service in our sector doesn't seem so new. What really we have learned over the last few years are some other ways that managing this looser or new organizational structure has to be done to make it successful. Most of our companies have moved away from traditional command and control structures, things like not monitoring vacation days, nor even expenses. Instead, they really focused on valuing people over process, innovation over efficiency, and giving employees context versus controls. So the CEOs of these companies, neither our command or control are micromanagers. Uh, they have to have a strong sense of humility to have the kind of transparency they need to communicate virtually to all of their stakeholders, how the company is performing and what your strategy is going forward. In some ways, this is a little easier in the software industry because our metrics for performance are the same at the beginning as they are during our IPO and as public companies. We've learned also that letting talent loose across the world allows talent centers to emerge around emerging leaders. One of our most recent successes had five people in their startup, two in Germany, two in Buenos Aires, and one in Malta. In the end, when we went public as a public company with a thousand employees, 200 people were employees in Buenos Aires. There have been some challenging challenges during COVID for this, and I'll just point out a few and end at that. Uh, one is with everybody working at home and schools not opening. Uh, many of the, these employees have had to stand back, and this has especially been a big pressure on women. Uh, secondarily, our employees, uh, especially in the US where we lack a national health policy for COVID, have had to piece together their own strategies for physical and mental health of their employees. Last but not least, uh, the Valley has had kind of a rocky time, Silicon Valley transitioning to stakeholder capitalism. You hear great stories like Mark Benioff's 1% pledge, uh, but at the same time, we see a blog post like the CEO from Coinbase this week that says, hey, you know, we're just in this for profit. Uh, leave your values at home and work at them separately. And you see some venture capitalists supporting that CEO while other venture capitalists see this as an abdication of leadership. So we still have a lot of changes overlaying what has been a very successful operating model for our well-performing sector. Thank you, Anne, uh, great comments. Um from someone who's got a unique perspective here. So appreciate that. Um, Joe, uh, Joe Herka, we'll uh, turn it over to you. He's the CEO of uh, ISU. I think I got that right. ISU. Uh, ISU. ISU. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the world, it's the world's leading omni-channel content tool and publishing platform. Joe has uh, 25 years and more of experience with startups and growth technology uh, uh organizations uh, global stints as well working in asia europe and the us so he brings a global perspective to this uh, particularly as he's managed these ventures from early stage all the way through ipo joe your comments thanks great to be here and uh, i'm actually really thrilled to to follow ann um there's, there's a lot of what you said that i've been putting in place and working with and and um maybe if we have a few minutes towards the end of this we can talk about that um Coinbase memo, <clears throat> uh, which would be interesting. Um, so uh, just really quickly about issue where this massive digital publishing platform, we have um, companies started in, in Copenhagen 13 and a half years ago. We've got offices in, um, in the US, Copenhagen and, and Berlin. We've got about 80 people. And I think of us now actually as having 80 different offices and living rooms all over the world. Um, and uh, having to make adjustments for that. We, we are a company that's also, um, we, we live in the heart of, uh, Silicon Valley. We're located in uh, headquarters, Palo Alto. Um, but we're, we're also, um, providing only at 80 people. We have 
over a million customers a year that are using our tools and software. So we have been spending our time really focused on how do we optimize engagement with our global audience and customers while uh, running this uh, relatively small organization and um, and staying profitable at the same time. We're we're a company. I like to say that the new the new unicorn is a is a pro grow, uh, both profitable and growing. Um, so I just uh, share that as a little bit of background in terms of my perspective on um, on running uh, running a company and um, what is referred to as the age of disruption. Um, I, I want to start my remarks by actually taking exception to the title of this entire panel. Um, I believe that we are always in an age of disruption. The world has constantly been in disruption from the big boom to uh, the the rise and fall of countries to technology. You know, we, uh, we we heard earlier that you know the most valuable companies in the world are technology companies right now. They didn't exist most of these companies uh, 10, 20 years ago. So this notion of how to operate in the age of disruption is like it's I, I think it's breathing. Um, we are always in an age of disruption. There there is no such thing as as not disruption. And I think we tend to have this tunnel vision of how challenging things are in the midst of our current disruption. But the truth is we know how to live in an age of disruption because we have gone through it over and over and over and over again. If we look at our resiliency as businesses, our resiliency as culture, uh, as cultures, it's, we, we have exercised this muscle of operating in disruption. We forget. And so what I would encourage everyone to do is uh, take some time and look at the times in our careers, in our businesses, uh, in our lives where we have dealt with specific challenges um, and use the tools that we use then, use the learnings that we had uh, at those points to, uh, to apply to right now and the next right now and the next right now and the next right now. Um, there is this false sense of wanting to return to normal. We hear that all the time. Co we want COVID to end. We want to, th there is no normal. Like get, we, we have to get this whole idea of normal out of our, uh, out of our awareness. There's an opportunity to grow. There's an opportunity to create. There's an opportunity to be new. If we live in a world where we're constantly reacting to or resisting the changes that are in front of us, we will not be able to take advantage of what's available to us. Um, and it's in that disruption, I think, where we, where we see real growth. A couple of quick things that I've been um, seeing, and I'll, I'll uh, piggyback on some of, of Ann's comments. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of running a, a company, there is a level of stress on our employees and their families like we've never seen before. And we don't even know the details. People are worried about getting sick. They're worried about their families getting sick because there is so much um, disparate uh, places in which people are living. There's, le there's less connection to their families. And so people are worried about what's going on. Take time to listen to what's happening to people on the team way more than you ever have before. And it's more challenging because uh, many of us are operating in, uh, in companies, like I said, where we have 80 offices in living rooms all over the world. Um, so it's important to use the tools, uh, connect with people on Slack, phone calls, check in with folks, ask how people are doing and listen to what's happening. Listen to what we're hearing from our employees. Listen to what we're hearing from our, uh, our, our customers. And rather than operate from this sense of wanting to react to it, I think it's an opportunity for us to like, if we can accept that we are always in this time of disruption, that there is no normal, we can actually operate from this space of listening to what's happening at a deeper level than we typically do. And we can be responsive rather than reactive. And I think if I can leave us with anything, it's about that notion of, how do we respond to what's happening as opposed to this knee-jerk reacting to what we're seeing immediately in front of us? Take a breath, go deeper, understand that everybody is operating with this, uh, with this sort of veil of, um, of stress that we 
aren't always used to. And it's stress that's being caused by everything from COVID to geopolitical situations to um, feeling sorry for Mike Wallace and how he had to handle things the other night. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, will forgive me for being American centric in my comments there. So, uh, and I'll just say one thing on the Coinbase thing. I mean, I, like, uh, sorry, at the end of the day, uh, companies are made up of human beings um, and our customers are who are buying our products and engaging with our products are human beings. And to dismiss the humanness of the people that we are working with, that we are working for, um, and that are working for us is, uh, is foolish. Um, so people have ideas, they have thoughts, it makes us richer and, um, uh, and, and more effective when we can uh, uh, recognize those differences and those ideas. Here, here. So. Uh, thank you, thank you, yeah. Joe. I'm sure you'll provoke some dialogue. Um, we can get to it in just a few more minutes. <laughs> Let me introduce Joanna, uh, Joanna Riley to you. She's the chief executive officer and also the co-founder of Sensia, uh, based in the, the U.S. and the West Coast. Sensia is built to transform the way enterprise companies hire talent. A uh, topic near and dear to my heart, Sensia's talent intelligent platform predictively matches the most in demand people to opportunities to scale and it's, it's powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is I think fascinating. But Joanne is an entrepreneur, an advocate, and absolutely a mentor for diversity and technology and organizations more broadly. Joanna, over to you. Thanks so much, Alan. And uh, and again, thank you, Alan, for being our great moderator. And, and thank you, Frank, for putting this together. Um, it's such a pleasure when you understand who your panelists are and you realize that they're all so fantastic. And that was that was the second I got this invite. I was like, absolutely, I want to be part of this conversation. Um, and already I'm, I'm taking notes furiously. So thank you all for sharing your perspectives. Um, I think that this is, you know, I'm a, I'm a fourth time entrepreneur. Uh, I've had, I've sold two companies and I've taken one public. And so Sensi is my fourth business. And so I've learned a lot by doing things wrong. Uh, and I think that times like these are great opportunities to do things wrong and figure out how to do them right in, in, a, in a weird way. We're all doing them for the first time. And, and just like Joe just said, it's not going to change. But I think that the things that make successful teams in general are still the exact same. And I think that those things, if you think about the three things that are, I think, the most important for making teams successful, a clear goal, clear responsibilities, clear vision of where the organization's going, communicated by the top. I think that safety psychologically for our employees is today more important than ever. I think that, you know, I expand on what Joe said, the mental health of the organization is at risk. And so understanding that they have to feel psychologically safe and that comes with, I believe in where the organization's going, I'm okay, I will be led in the right path. And I think that's a, a critical time right now. And I think also, and this, this, is a, this is a hard one because it's required a lot of reimagination, which is, for successful teams, they have to have opportunities to get together outside of work or outside of doing work. And so that has been a fun task for me. Uh, I crowdsource that information from anybody and everybody. So if anyone wants to leave great a comment in the, in the chat about some fantastic events or things they've done with their teams virtually, um, I have a lot to share back with you because I, I ask everybody this question. Um, but they are fantastic. I feel that with us making an investment and focus on connecting our teams in this digital world, that we're more connected than we've ever been. And we are tripling in size right now as an organization. So many days, my team comes on the Zoom calls, and they don't know a lot of the people that are on that Zoom call. So it is a different experience to hire people, onboard them and train them when you've never met them, but it's also an exciting opportunity to get deep and get vulnerable with the rest of our organization in a way that normally we might not, because even if we are in person, those new employees would be given tasks, but they wouldn't have an opportunity to connect. So I think that leads me to something that 
was critically important for us, um, which is transparency. I remember when we went on lockdown and I had the next all hands and I didn't have a script. And I actually don't think my board knew or my investors knew what the script should be at the time because nobody knew. And I said, I don't know. And I don't know what the future holds. My job is to make sure this organization lasts through many disruptions and is safe and secure in the long run. And that is exactly what I'll do. But it, me saying, I don't know, but I do know that I've hired some of the smartest people I've ever met. And this is what we're dealt with. And we're going to plan for the worst and we're going to hope for the best. But what can we do with the technology that we have to reimagine the future and get ahead of it? I cannot tell you the amount of brilliant decisions that came out of a team that I don't think normally people would feel comfortable to say, hey, why don't you guys help me figure out what we should do here? Because I'm going to go all in and back you up as a leader to do that. We launched a technology, we took our technology and helped, uh, we repurposed it uh, at the time of COVID. So this was uh, in March, I, you know, we, we all went on lockdown and our technology helped find people job opportunities. What came out of that uh, has led to, we are right about to hit our next year's pre-COVID full year projections. I can tell you that at a time when enterprise, it, software companies are, are under a lot of pressure and a lot of people aren't buying, it is because of this imagination and these, and these ideas that we really transformed. And so uh, that, you know, we launched a product uh, on, August, on April 6th and today we've helped two and a half million people get into jobs that had been displaced. And that is something super rewarding and all things that came out of this idea. And it took, it was, it was just magical how fast the team band together, but I think it came from being vulnerable and transparent. And that is something that I think if I, if I say in this new world of disruption, it's okay. I, I think for CEOs to be vulnerable and to be transparent and ask for help from their team because they're excited to do it. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I think we're, we can all relate to your challenges um, and uh, transparency. We don't know necessarily what we're going to be doing tomorrow. I think that all resonates with us. Thank you very much. Our last uh, uh, speaker is Eva Lota Jostad. Um, she's joining us uh, from uh, the Nordics, uh, Sweden, I believe, um, right now. Eva Lota is a member of the supervisory board of Metro uh, based in Dusseldorf, Germany. Uh, Metro, if you're not aware, is one of the world's largest retailers with membership clubs uh, literally around the world, turnover just north of 27 billion euros. Eva Lota has served as a CEO of privately held companies for over a decade, and uh, she brings a very global uh, perspective to this the issue of disruptions. Eva Lota, over, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually Swedish, that's correct, but I live in, and work right now in Copenhagen and I work, I would say, still globally. I would like to, to stress a little bit in these times what I find very important for every leader to, to actually focus upon and, and to develop further. Um, and I would say there's three things actually as a leader you need to embrace and, and enhance in yourself in these times. One and foremost, I would say, is that we're all connected in a global world. And I think we all sense that somehow on some type of level of, of consciousness. So, you know, these days are over when you can only deliver something without delivering to actual growth for people. And that, for me, is what leadership is about, that you have to do both. It's not either or. So those three things for me is very much about, of course, you need to have a vision. You can't just have a business idea. You need to understand why you're doing things long term as well as short term. So the visionary, the purposeful, the, the actual uh, needs to also be incorporated in everything you do. It needs to be authentic. It cannot just be something that you hope for. It's something you need to 
to engage in truly. truly. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that you need to deliver. You need to deliver to the stakeholders. You need to deliver to shareholders. You need to deliver to, you know, the the the, the board and, and 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 the management and so forth due to financial results, and and that's a given. However, you also need to deliver broader these days. You need to deliver to a better planet. You need to deliver to a better world with your own way of acting as a leader. Uh, and the, the third thing I think is the most important thing and maybe the hardest thing is actually to have a sense of self. Uh, a sense of self as a leader is how you are perceiving yourself, how you behave to really take a look at upon yourself in understanding how is my behavior. And the second thing would be to look upon how do others see me? How do others perceive me? And I use the word perceive because that's reality, right? So whatever we think, how people perceive is their reality. So when you put those things together, I would say there is no such thing that you can be a work leader, you be a person at work, and another person when you go in your private, your personal space. For me, that's one. So those days are over when you can say, you know, um, when I'm privately with my children, I have three children, you know, I'm like this, but at work, I'm like that. You know, you have to be your own self wherever you are in good and bad. And you have to understand what that does to people. And if you're in the right place to be a leader. So those three things I would like to emphasize that are crucial for any leader. And, and uh, I would really stress the, the specific thing of being very authentic, be able to connect yourself and understanding who you are and how that is connecting to the vision of the company and what you are delivering to the stakeholders and the shareholders. Thank you so much, uh, Eva Lota. I appreciate that and appreciate all of the comments from the members of the panel. Um, we just have about 10 minutes left and uh, we've covered a lot of ground and um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just pose a few questions if, if, uh, if I could to panel members. It's it, you've certainly, I've taken a whole bunch of notes here. I appreciate your insights and wisdom and experience. Uh, l let me just start with, uh, with a question for, for Joe uh, Herkin. Uh, you talked about, and I, and it, it was certainly, uh, uh, emphasized as well by a number of the other panel members. You talked about the, the importance of listening and actively listening. H how do you do that with a, with a distributed workforce? You, you have 80 employees. They're all over the place. Uh, clearly, CEOs need the best information. They need it quickly. H how does this distributed workplace impact your ability to, to understand What's going on in the markets, customers, so on, but what's going on in their lives as well? What What do you think the keys are to connecting with people? Yeah, so I think it's important, you know, like uh, there's a lot of water cooler talk that isn't happening anymore, right? People don't people don't have water coolers in their living rooms. Um, so we, we use I use Slack pretty extensively. I I um I, I'll wake up early in the mornings because we have people all over the place, and I'll check in with dozens of people at a time individually on Slack. Um, just ask how they're doing, what's happening um, with their families. Um, I make sure that our managers are checking in with people and, uh, you know, not to be invasive or too personal, but, um, but no, like, what, what is happening? We've had people who's, uh, we've had people who've had COVID. We've had people whose family members have had COVID. Um, so it's a combination of using Slack, telephone calls, um, lots of Zoom meetings, uh, Keep, keep your camera open during a Zoom meeting so you can actually, you know, see who people are. Um, I think a lot of it is we use, um, we have monthly surveys from the company where, within the company where we ask people, you know, a range of different questions. We get real feedback. Um, I, I read all of those. I make sure I respond. We then talk about those in company meetings. Uh, we used to have a monthly company meeting. Uh, for everybody, we then added an additional half hour company get together where we're checking in with each other and talking about what's going on. So, um, again, a lot of it is is just using the tools to check in. 
but beyond that is the is and a few other folks have mentioned this too um it's not just a check in it's it's like start looking at the bigger picture of what each person is really dealing with go deeper than just the surface answers um and understand that particularly when people are making a comment in in a survey or um responding to a question there's there's more to it um and i think just knowing that we care like real for real like right. do we care about them as a human being uh makes a big difference uh, and do you do you want to add anything to that i know this is uh something you think about a lot do you want to weigh in on this topic sure just a couple things uh one listening is really hard and sometimes it's what you don't hear that's more important than what you hear um actually there's a great annual shareholder letter that Jeff Bezos wrote not this year but last year which has a great section about listening to his stakeholders i encourage everybody to read that letter um i also one comment here is we set up uh a weekly meeting uh in march it's not weekly anymore it's you know twice a month for our ceos and we've all been talking about all the other stakeholders uh but it is really challenging for ceos uh and they need someone to talk to not just their board of directors uh so many of our ceos have brought in for themselves they've joined other ceo groups they've also tried to shake it up for their companies and brought in outside speakers more often than not uh we had a lot of racial unrest we still have in the united states that gave a great opportunity for the tech companies especially startups with small numbers of employees that weren't that diversified to bring in new voices to the company as well so sometimes listening requires you to shake it up a bit uh but we also try to understand the challenges that our CEOs have which the CEOs are really really stressed right now so again we've got a lot of seat through 1 2 3 4 CEOs on this call and you've all been kind enough to mention every other stakeholder but yourself. Thank you so much. Uh I I have a question for for Eva Lota uh because you're you're more traditional uh company it's certainly with with your metro role. Um you know, we see a lot of companies moving functions online more and more and more in in this era. Um people who may employees who may have not had experience online Um what do you think the biggest risks are for the organization as you move more and more functions online? And what do you think the biggest opportunities are? And I I just want you to talk about the people side of that as opposed to the the um uh the value chain um Well, I think the opportunities are obviously um that you are able to to connect to people without traveling to see them. um and uh, utilizing technology in that sense i'm i'm actually on another board as well in in helsinki finland which is all about tech so so i would say uh, from that perspective also there is great numbers to see that actually what you would think traditional companies wouldn't do they're actually doing and it's also quite engaging in in coworkers as we see ourselves now all of a sudden they're able to be you know entering meeting rooms where they might not been able to enter before uh because you can easily connect participants in this way where you get to interact and chat and talk to people where you normally probably wouldn't uh, so it's an easy access you can say from from a practical point of view and then the other part is of course that it's also quite not so personal right so so you don't have that sense of actually sitting down with the person and 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 actually talk to them so i would say there has been a structure set up in in what you should do online and what you shouldn't do online when it comes to people um because some things you probably shouldn't do online you should wait for them to to be exposed for things like that like uh, personal feedback sessions you could do but not always preferably so so i would say overall uh my experience from the different boards and my previous roles and so on of going with virtual rooms like this 
to be able to connect. It's, it's helping a global workforce to connect. It's helping people to be in places they normally might not be invited to. And, and also ease of access. So overall, it's more positive, I think, than negative. Thank you so much. Uh, last question, which I'll open it up to Alusula and, um, and also Joanna. And it's this issue about um, psychological safety. And um, actually, I just see we've got 21 seconds left. <laughs> All right. Well, um, final comments. I guess we're going to get cut off in 13 seconds. So I apologize. I thought we could uh, have a few more minutes left. Um, I hope you're all feeling psychologically safe. Thank you, panel members. Uh, really appreciate your insight. And uh, I've got copious notes. Please provide feedback. And again, I, I wish we had more time to go through these uh, discussions. Uh, great insights. Um, thank you so much. Thanks to Frank and the Harassus group for uh, ho hosting this. I hope we can all stay in touch uh, going forward. Really enjoyed this. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay.